In this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate decay rates from quantum field theory. Specifically, I'm going to show you how to derive the general formula that you use to do those calculations. All the other introductory remarks are in the math section, so let's jump straight into that. In quantum field theory, it is a bit of a lengthy process to go from the classical action of a given quantum field theory to actual physical predictions like scattering cross-sections and decay rates. There are two commonly used ways. The first is the operator method, and the second is the path integral method, which basically just differ in how the scattering matrix is computed. However, beyond the scattering matrix computation, the procedure is the same. They both yield equivalent scattering matrices, and therefore the same formulas must be used to obtain physical information from the scattering matrix. In this video, I will derive the formula for the decay rate in terms of the scattering matrix, more specifically a part of the scattering matrix called the Feynman amplitude. This is one of the most important formulas relating the scattering matrix to physically measurable quantities, along with the differential scattering cross-section general formula. There's a link in the description to my video on that. Because we are talking about the decay rate of a single arbitrary type of particle, the relevant reaction is one part particle transitioning to n prime particles, which I've written out here kind of like a chemical equation. Before we proceed through this derivation, we must think more critically about what a decay rate is. Only then will we be able to establish a specific enough starting point for it to be possible to derive a useful mathematical expression for it. Thankfully, the decay rate isn't a very conceptually difficult idea. Specifically, it is defined as the transition or decay probability per second per unit volume per source particle. It's usually denoted with gamma, so then we have this initial result for gamma. This is, however, equivalent to saying that the decay rate is the transition rate per unit volume divided by the particle density, so we have this, and then we can take the transition rate per unit volume to the differential transition rate per unit volume, and I'll denote that with this symbol here. So this is the differential transition probability density, so then the derivative with respect to volume and the time would be the rate per unit volume. More specifically, d tau is the differential transition momentum space probability density, so this differential on it, is referring to outgoing momentum differentials. You'll see more about this as we go along. The decaying particle number density will be denoted like this. Hopefully you're getting the general idea of what's going on, but if you're still a slight bit confused about what some of these quantities involved really are, well, it'll become clear as we do the math, so don't panic yet. Regardless, this notation choice leaves us with this expression for the decay rate, where this integral is over the differential inside there, so it's with respect to momentum differentials. This preliminary formula will serve as the starting point for this derivation. In a decay rate calculation like this, we are considering a particle with a localized bell curve-like distribution in momentum space, and therefore also in position space, decaying to yield a set of output particles with momentum vectors in particular differential ranges, as discussed further below. Hopefully you now see why I called d tau f I, a momentum space probability density, because those differentials that this d represents are the momentum space volume differentials. The process of deriving the decay rate for this type of reaction will consist of deriving an expression for this quantity and this one for the decaying source in terms of the states in question and associated quantities. Once we've calculated them, we can insert them back in here and we'll get an expression that's useful to us. In this video, I will explicitly derive the formula only for a boson decaying into n prime bosons. However, I will give the results for a boson decaying to fermions and a mix of fermions and bosons. I will also list the results for a fermion decaying to all of these output possibilities. The only reason why anything changes when one goes from considering bosons to considering fermions, or vice versa, is that bosonic and fermionic states are traditionally normalized differently. The next section will discuss these normalizations, and in the section after that we'll compute this quantity, and in the one after that we'll compute this quantity, and then we'll insert it all in and get the answer. So the traditional normalizations are given by these inner products here for bosons and fermions, and that requires these normalizations for the individual single particle states, which then in turn requires these identity operators. If we want them to be consistent with the normalizations we've chosen, from the identity operators we can see which momentum space volume elements are consistent with these normalization selections, these ones here. These volume elements 
results are what we're really after because it is through these results that the state normalization affects the decay rate formula. This is the effect that I was talking about at the end of the introduction. The normalization affects the form of these volume elements and then the form of these volume elements affects the decay rate formula, if you pick the same normalization, then these volume elements would be the same, and the decay rates would be the same for all cases, but that's not done because that's not the normal convention. Historically, the integration measures were actually selected first, and then the normalizations that were required for consistency were reverse engineered from them. Specifically, EK in the denominators was selected to make the volume elements Lorentz invariant, and the other constants are just conventions that are popular, and in many cases convenient, although they don't really do much to help us here. We will now begin the process of computing this quantity. This will require us to first compute this one and then evaluate the derivatives. Given the normalizations provided above, such a localized one particle state, as was described in the introduction, can be written like this, where f1 of k consists of a localized peak at some location in momentum space. Remember from the intro that we are considering a decay of this state into a particular final state, with the final particles exiting with momentum vectors localized to differential sized momentum volume intervals. The probability amplitude for the state i to scatter into some final state f is simply the scattering matrix where the s operator time evolves the asymptotic initial state to the asymptotic output times. See my video on the s operator and the interaction picture. There's a link in the description. The momentum space probability density for ending up in some particular final state of the form given when starting in the given initial state is there for just this, where because we're in natural units, all of these quantities are the same, and as a result I'll use them interchangeably, and that's the same reason why these two can be used interchangeably. And beyond that, while I use E1 for the initial energy of the decaying particle, at the end I switch to EI. In our effort to obtain this quantity, and eventually its differentiated version, we must break up the S operator into a forward scattering part and a transition part. I'll explain what these are next. So the breakup is conventionally like this, where I is the identity operator and T is called the transition operator. Now I will explain what the forward scattering and transition parts are. The forward scattering part of this matrix is just the probability amplitude that the initial state is the final state and no decay occurs, but instead the particle in the initial state enters and exits without changing state at all. For some reason this is traditionally called forward scattering even though it is the absence of decay or scattering. The second term describes decay. It is the probability amplitude that decay induces the input particle to transition to a different final state. This quantity here is called the transition amplitude. From what we have learned, we can now write down the differential transition momentum space probability density and compute from it the transition rate per unit volume. To do this, we must first manipulate the differential transition momentum space probability density on its own. To obtain this quantity, one simply ignores the forward scattering term in the scattering matrix and the expression for the complete probability density based on the scattering matrix, which gets us to here. The standard decay rate formula naturally ignores forward scattering, so we can ignore this quantity from now on, the one with the forward scattering part. This ignoring of forward scattering is why we are in pursuit of this quantity instead of this one, which is the forward scattering inclusive version of this one. When I refer to the differential scattering probability in the intro, this is what I was talking talking about. It is really a momentum space probability density. Now I mentioned this in the intro in order to avoid confusion straight off, and now that we have that in complete context, hopefully any confusion that remained from that is gone. The next step is to insert the formula we wrote down for the initial state into this quantity. The initial state we wrote down is this. Inserting it ultimately gets us down to here. The next step is to do the momentum integrals. The process of doing these momentum integrals begins with momentum conservation. Momentum conservation is what will ultimately allow us to do the momentum integrals. This can be imposed with a delta function, thus allowing the transition amplitude to be written as the product of a delta function and some other quantity, usually called the Feynman amplitude. So we we have this form here, where kf is the sum of all final four momenta. The Feynman amplitude is what is given directly by the Feynman rules. There is a link in the description to a video where I show how to derive the Feynman rules for QED. The calculations contained give a good idea of why
why the Feynman amplitude is important. Inserting this gets us to this result here. We can then apply this famous delta function identity, getting us to here. We can now write this delta function in terms of its definition and then insert it in, which gets us here. Now we are almost ready to do the k integrations. The next step is to remember the form of f1. It consists of a bell curve localized around an average k1 bar. This means that when placed under the integration, we have this result. Additionally, while k1 tilde is a separate integration variable from k1, the function f1 is the same regardless of which integration variable it depends on. So its localized peak lies in the same place in momentum space. So the complete set of approximate equalities is actually this, where if it wasn't clear, we were taking the average momentum to be constant and not another integration variable. Basically, we were replacing the integration variable in the matrix elements with the constant average value because f1 behaves approximately like a delta function. Inserting that gets us here. Now we just have Fourier transforms of the f1 function and its complex conjugate because of the phase factor, that right there. I will use the following notation for this Fourier transform, f tilde of x. This f tilde of x satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation because the phases used in the Fourier transform are plane wave solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation. This will be a very important fact later on after we've finished computing this quantity and we want to find the decay particle number density. Specifically because they satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation, the time component of the Klein-Gordon Noether current gives us the number density. Where this Noether current is the one associated with U1 invariance of a complex Klein-Gordon scalar field, which you may be familiar with if you know a bit more than I'm expecting you to for this video, doing the momentum integrals by inserting the Fourier transform notation leaves us with a time phase because the integrals are only over the components of the three momentum. This actually ends up equaling one, however. If you remember back to how we got here, then you will remember that by doing these integrals, we were integrating over this delta function, which imposes this relation, and through the energy-momentum relation, that imposes this relation, which of course makes the exponent in that phase zero, so it just vanishes and we get down to here. And then we can recognize a modulus squared there and write it like that, and then take the relevant space and time derivatives to get the rate per unit volume, which leaves us with this. Just gets rid of the four-dimensional space-time integral. Now on to the particle number density. To compute the particle number density, we must recall a couple of things about the f1 tilde function. First, it describes the position space spread of the decaying particles, and because the plane waves used in the Fourier transform above solve the Klein-Gordon equation, it satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation too. This means that we can use the time component of the Klein-Gordon conserved current to get the number density of the decaying particles. This directly yields what we need. From studying the Klein-Gordon equation, we remember that the relevant conserved current is this. From this, we can extract the number density of the decaying particles. Specifically, we have this. Now we can remember that f1 tilde was that function. Given that f1 of k consists of a localized peak centered around k1 bar, the Fourier transform will be that of the delta function times a slowly varying function of x, meaning the three-dimensional position, not including time. Evaluating the Fourier transform transform of such a quantity provides us with this, where this is the slowly varying function of x. Inserting this into the number density formula that we just found and simplifying gets us this result. So now we have what we're looking for there. We now have everything we need to write out the final decay rate formula. The two key results are these, and this was that formula we were going to insert them into. Inserting them in gives us this, which of course just simplifies down to this. Now I said that the changing normalizations would change the formulas when you move to fermions from bosons, and so I've got all those results. The bosons decaying to purely fermions has this decay rate according to those standard normalizations. If we've got a boson decaying to a combination of fermions and bosons, we use this formula. For a fermion decaying to pure bosons, we use this one. For fermion to pure fermions, we use this one. And for fermions to a mix of fermions and bosons, we use this one. So now you know how to derive the famous formula for decay rates in terms of the Feynman amplitude, thus allowing you to calculate them straight from quantum field theory. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope it was educational, and I hope it was a lot of fun. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. D-trick out.